Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Chapter 4, The Traveler. Rashad walked along the side of the cracked country road, humming a melody that kept perfect time with the rhythm of his tread. The song was coming along well, inspired by his jaunt across the open fields and through idyllic small towns. He was working on a smooth instrumental section that flowed smooth as silk like the babbling brook he had slept beside two nights before. The lyrics were already set, and he thought that tonight would be the night it all came together. He squeezed the guitar's case handle, clutched in his left hand, and smiled. He couldn't wait to settle in as the sun fell below the horizon and let his fingers bring the song to life for the first time. He turned down an overgrown dirt road, seeing it as it once was, like a ghost from his past. He had been a teenager the last time he traveled that lane. That had been the happiest summer of his life. He had met what he thought was the girl of his dreams and had spent two weeks falling head over heels in love with her. Puppy love, his parents had called it, and maybe it was, but memory sweetened things and he thought he would always carry a torch for little Mindy Waters. He met her while he was riding his bicycle around the edge of Crystal Lake. He and his parents were camping not too far from her home and the first glimpse of her had quite literally taken his breath away. He let his bike glide to a standstill, staring at the brown, headed, green-eyed girl with skinny legs and the last vestiges of a sunburn still coloring her cheeks. He never seen anything so beautiful. Later that night, after both their parents had drifted off to sleep, they had snuck out and met each other on the dock near her home. His hormone-flooded system had, of course, invented several lurid scenarios by the time of their scheduled rendezvous. What she had shown him that first night turned out to be very different. She had led him along the shore to a pair of large, two-story houses that sat side by side up a slope where the forest really began. Lights burned in the one on the left. It looked like a log cabin, all warm wood and exposed timbers. The house on the right was dark, abandoned. He thought that it had once been painted blue, but winter storms and years of vacancy had allowed the place to fall into disrepair. More, the front door was missing, and the big circular window on the second floor had been shattered. Dagger-like shards of glass clung to the frame, twinkling like diamonds in the light of the full moon. What happened here, Mindy? Rashad asked. It happened a couple years ago, she said. A family had just moved into the log cabin. Their last name was Jarvis, and they moved here from the big city after the mom and dad separated. There was the mom and her two children her teenage daughter Trish, and 12-year-old son Tommy. One weekend, a group of teens showed up at the neighboring house, shouting and laughing. Trish and Tommy were excited. This was their chance to let their hair down and meet some new people. Unfortunately, the Jarvis family weren't the only ones who noticed the new arrivals. Have you ever heard of Jason Voorhees? Uh, the Crystal Lake Slasher? Mindy had nodded. The teenagers threw a party the second night they were here and invited a pair of twin girls from up the lake. Jason killed every single one of them, as well as a man who came to the lake to hunt Jason after Jason killed his little sister and Mrs. Jarvis. Trish and Tommy were the last, but Jason got much more than he bargained for when he tried to finish them off. Tommy tricked Jason and then attacked the killer with his own machete. Wild, Rashad had said, glancing over to the blue house. Did Tommy kill him? Everyone thought so, Mindy replied. I heard they even buried Jason in a cemetery near here. But a couple years later, the murders started up again. They always start up again. It wasn't the best first date for sure, but Rashad was already completely smitten. The next two weeks had passed in a blur of first kisses and one passionate necking session in the crawl space under Mindy's house, where Rashad had managed to get his hands beneath Mindy's shirt before she rolled away giggling. She was the girl he compared everyone that came after to. Not many had measured up. He rounded a bend in the path, wondering if she still lived in the area. What would she think if he showed up at her door? Would she even remember him? He didn't think he could handle it if he found out that that summer that was so special to him meant nothing to her. It was probably better to just live with the pleasant memories. 
Fifty feet further brought the two houses into view. Rashad paused, taking the scene in. The blue paint was peeling from the side of the teenager's house, revealing the gray wood beneath. Someone had boarded up the windows in the intervening years, and there was a sign nailed to the front of the house that read, No Trespassing. Opposite it, the Jarvis house was much changed. Its once warm and inviting exterior was now pitted by the ravages of time. Its windows shattered by local kids out to prove they were not afraid of haunted houses. If there are any haunted houses out there, Rashad thought, these two would be them. He briefly considered camping on the Jarvis home's front porch and then decided against it. Sleeping on the doorstep of a murder house seemed a surefire way to have bad dreams. He moved down the path, admiring the sun as it turned to diamonds on the placid blue lake surface to his right. He sighed, feeling at peace with himself and the world around him. He found a nice flat spot under the boughs of a willow tree, a hundred yards further along, and quickly set about pitching his small one-man tent. Finished, he gathered some firewood and fallen pine needles for kindling. He was settled in beside the crackling fire five minutes later, watching the last vestiges of the sun fall below the horizon. The red light turned the surface of Crystal Lake to blood. Rashad set his battered guitar case on the ground beside him and opened the lid, admiring the acoustic guitar inside. It was the tailor, his pride and joy. The instrument was the most expensive thing he owned, aside from his old motorcycle back home, but he knew that it was worth every penny when he ran his fingers along the fretboard. He picked the tailor up and held its familiar weight, thinking that he spoke better through it than he ever did with words. He strummed a chord and frowned. Its tone wasn't as bright as it should be. It was time to change the strings. He rummaged through his guitar case and pulled out a package of new strings and a set of wire cutters. He wouldn't need a tuner because he had perfect pitch. A loon cried out somewhere across the lake as it took flight. Crickets began to sing amongst the reeds. Rashad paused as he removed the last of the old guitar strings, listening to the night song. He loved being out there. He tore open the plastic bag that held the low E string and then froze as a twig snapped right behind him. He turned, saw that the guitar case was no longer resting on the soft pack of earth near him, and came face to face with Philip Pont. The coroner was filthy, his once pristine white lab coat now so stained by blood and dirt that it would never come clean again. Rashad met his menacing stare, saw the hard shell guitar case poised over Hans' head, and felt his blood run cold. Rashad didn't even have time to raise a hand. Hans brought the case down on Rashad's head, cracking the bottom and sending stars cascading across his vision. He slumped to the ground, his body trembling in the throes of a trauma-induced seizure. The light dimmed as the world swam away from him. There was peace in the depths of that darkness. He longed for it, but it was not meant to be. Agony pierced through his stupor, and Rashad screamed himself back up to the light. He glanced down at himself and loosed the most primal shriek of his life. His murderer was kneeling over his prone form, clutching Rashad's wire cutters on his gory hand. The tip of the tool was embedded in the soft flesh of his stomach below his belly button. The man squeezed the handles and... Fresh pain erupted through Rashad as the cutter's teeth chewed inexorably through more and more of his raw, screaming flesh. Rashad thrust his hands out to clutch at the tool, to hold it tight where it could do no more harm. The man glared at him and Rashad saw no remorse, no pity. They were soulless windows to the very pits of hell. They were not the eyes of a human being. The man flexed his fingers and pushed against Rashad's hands. He was powerful, unbelievably, impossibly so. The wire cutter slid forward through his stomach, chewing and chewing. Rashad loosed a gurgling moan as his entrails began to ooze through the growing wound. He looked back up into the killer's eyes, and for a moment he imagined he saw a different face hovering over him in the night. He saw an old-fashioned hockey mask and eyes the color of red-hot embers smoldering in his fire. Then the wire cutter's teeth bit through his sternum, and he saw no more. Hans kept cutting in spite of his victim's death. 
He cut completely through Rashad's ribcage and then bent them outwards in a semblance of the fabled Viking Blood Eagle. Finished, he stepped back and cocked his head to one side and then the other, studying his work. Something inside of Hunt, something deeper than the soul of Jason, chuckled in appreciation at the sight. The rotten thing thought that Rashad looked very, very funny indeed. Hunt turned away and walked along the path, not sparing a glance at the two houses when he passed them. They did not matter. What mattered was what lay ahead of him. What mattered was what the voices in his head told him he must do. Yes, Jason, said his mother. You must hurry. You must find her. You must be made whole again. Yes, Mommy, he thought. I will do as you say. Then we can go home together once more. Chapter 5 Hitchhikers Stephen drove down Cunningham Road, barely seeing the road, his mind full of his swirling thoughts. It was amazing the difference one day could make. Yesterday he was adrift and listless, lost without any hope that he would ever see Jessica again. Now he was driving to her mother's home to really talk for the first time since everything went wrong. The song on the radio changed, the blaring electric guitars flooding the car's interior with sound. Stephen used to like being surrounded by loud, raucous noise. He had thrived on the chaos of wild music and wilder parties. He and Jessica even began dating at one such event held in a fallow field near the Loomis family farm. He nodded his head to the music, remembering how the moonlight seemed to dance in her hair and the sound of her laughter had rang out like silver bells at Christmas time. She turned his world upside down. It was a shame that he hadn't realized that until it was too late, and she was walking away from him to jump in a friend's car. She hadn't even looked back as the tires flung a cloud of dust into the air that settled in the tears falling down his cheeks. He knew what had happened now. Hindsight, as the saying went, was twenty twenty. Jessica grew tired of the parties. She was growing up while he was standing still. The final straw had come one afternoon when he'd been driving them along Cunningham Road. Jessica had been quiet all day, and she had seemed to be about to tell him something important when another car pulled up beside them, honking their horn. It was one of Stephen's friends from high school, and that wasn't the first time he'd pulled this stunt. Stephen had broken out in a wide grin. He was ready to race. Stephen, Jessica said, putting a restraining hand on his arm. Don't. He'd like to think that he paused at least a second to consider her, but he knew that wasn't true. Instead, he had loosed a cowboy yeehaw and stomped on the gas pedal. The race was neck and neck until they had come around a curve and come face to face with an oncoming semi-truck. Stephen didn't know if they were lucky or blessed by some great who-knows somewhere out there, but he did know that they both would have been killed had the roadside been wooded. It wasn't, and they had ended up fifty feet from the asphalt, their wheels buried to the lug nuts in soft earth. He had turned to Jessica, his heart in his throat, ready to laugh off their close call, but the look on her face had pulled him up short. She sat against the passenger door, both hands clutching her lower abdomen protectively, staring wide-eyed at Stephen, Looking back on that day, the few feet that had lain between them now seemed like an impassable gulf. There had been no great confrontation, no screaming recriminations. She had simply shook her head, her eyes going cold. 
Jessica had run out of his life two days later. Stephen shook his head to clear it and focused on the road before him. That was the past and he was a different person now. At least Randy had told him he was. Maybe he was after all. Diana was reaching out to him after months of radio silence. Stephen came around a bend in the road and slowed as he caught sight of three hitchhikers with their thumbs in the air. He came to a stop and waited as they jogged towards him and climbed inside. A pretty brunette and a young man climbed in the back seat, while a slender strawberry blonde took the front seat beside him. Stephen caught a hint of her perfume and felt his heart start to race. Thank you so much, said the blonde, giving him a big smile. We've been waiting for almost an hour now. Sure thing, Stephen replied as he pulled back out onto the road. Where are you headed? We're going out to Camp Crystal Lake, said the man as he put an arm around the brunette. Stephen nodded. Oh yeah? Planning on smoking a little dope, having a little premarital sex, and getting slaughtered? The blonde's smile faltered, and she glanced over her shoulder to her two friends in the back. Stephen burst out laughing. <laughs> Relax, guys, it's a joke, just a little Crystal Lake levity there. So, why are you going out there? The brunette kissed her man on the cheek. Well, now that Jason is dead, we were planning on smoking a little dope, having a little premarital sex, and not getting slaughtered. Oh, to be young again, Stephen said. He felt something brush across his thigh and turned to see the blonde wiggling her nose like a rabbit. God, Stephen thought, she is so freaking cute. No, get that out of your head right now, Haas. Think about Jessica. She's who you want, who you can't live your life without. What are you talking about? She asked, twirling a strand of hair around her finger. You are young. My name is Alexis, by the way. The two lovebirds are Deborah and Luke. It's very nice to meet all of you, Stephen said. He turned down an overgrown dirt road and stopped in front of an old rusted chain that spanned the road. A rusted metal sign hung from it, notifying all who would pass by that the property beyond was condemned. Here we are, he said. The county tore down all the cabins a few years ago, but this is where the original camp used to be. Sweet, Luke said, as he and Deborah clambered out of the vehicle and shouldered their packs. Thanks a lot, man. You're welcome, Stephen said, waving goodbye to the couple. Have fun. We will, Deborah said with a wink as she shut the car door. Stephen chuckled, turning back to see Alexis still staring at him in the passenger seat. She smiled and took his hand in hers. Her touch was amazingly warm and pleasant. Come with us, she said. We're thinking of going skinny dipping later. Stephen was momentarily speechless. Alexis noticed how flustered he was and giggled, waiting for his response. Why now, he thought, exasperated. I've been lonely and hopeless for all this time, and she comes along now, on the day I get a chance to reconnect with Jessica? If there is a god somewhere out there, he must be cruel. He sighed. I'd love to. I really would. But I have to meet someone later. Alexis's face fell. Your girlfriend? Stephen shrugged. It was too complicated to explain. Go on, he said. Have fun. She gave him one final smile before leaning over and kissing him gently on the cheek. Her lips sent electric shocks through his body, and he shivered. You don't know what you're missing, she said. Oh, I do, Stephen sighed, but I have to go anyway. Okay, Alexis said, getting out of the car. Good night. Stephen watched her join the others, and then the three stepped over the chain and were swallowed up by the night. He gripped the steering wheel tightly, frustration playing his nerves like a tuning fork. She was almost perfect. Almost. The one thing missing was the one thing he knew he had to have. This woman wasn't Jessica. Fuck, he muttered as he shifted the car into drive and pulled away.
Alexis ran ahead of Luke and Deborah towards the welcome warmth of the campfire, laughing despite the chilly night air that brought goosebumps to her naked flesh. Skinny dipping in the moonlight had been a blast, though it would have been much more fun if she had someone to hold on to while she floated in the placid lake. She began to towel off, wondering where the cute guy was and who he had had to meet. It had to be a girlfriend, right? He was so nice and he had the kindest eyes. Why was it that all the decent guys were already taken? She tossed the towel aside and shrugged into her flannel shirt. She heard a zipper behind her and turned to see Luke crawling into the tent. Deborah lingered near the fire, shifting from one foot to the other, roses blooming in her cheeks. Do you mind if Luke and I use the tent for half an hour? She asked. Another pang of loneliness ran through Alexis, and she had to fight to keep her face pleasant. Sure, she said. Why don't you guys keep it for the whole night? I'm going to sleep out here by the fire. Deborah frowned. Are you sure, Alex? You don't have to do that. I know I don't, Alexis said. I want to. It's a beautiful night. I'm going to fall asleep under the stars. Are you sure? Of course, Alexis said, throwing a playful kick at her friend. Now go! Shoo! Deborah went, giggling. Alexis snuggled down into her sleeping bag, watching as Deborah climbed into the tent. She heard muffled sighs as two shadows cast by the light of a lantern became one. She heard Deborah begin to moan and decided she might need to give the couple a little more space. She got to her feet and walked out of the fire's circle of light, picking her path with care between the trees. A twig snapped to her right and she froze, looking about her. She wasn't concerned. What was there to be afraid of now that Jason was dead? Maybe it was a deer feeding nearby. She would like to see a deer up close. She walked on, far enough away now that she couldn't hear Deborah's panting and Luke's inane and laughable pillow talk, but not so far into the dark that she couldn't see the fire. Another twig cracked near her, and she turned. The smile died on her face as a ghastly figure sprang from the forest. He was taller than her by half a foot and barrel-chested, his eyes black pits sunken deep into their sockets. Large patches of his hair seemed to have either fallen out or been ripped out by force, and his skin glistened mutely in the dark as if covered in a viscous slime. Alexis opened her mouth to scream for help, but the man was faster. He lunged forward, plunging a long hunting knife into the side of her neck. There was very little pain. That was until the man yanked the blade towards him, bifurcating her windpipe and cutting a huge gash in her throat. Warm blood flew, cascading down her body and splashing on her killer's already soiled clothes. He never made a sound as he watched her pass into forever night. Deborah and Luke's tongues and limbs were entwined in a feverish embrace. He gripped her naked breast, enthralled by the soft weight of it. She moaned her breath into his mouth, and he gave it back. He considered himself fairly experienced with the opposite sex, but he had to admit there was something about Deborah that made him feel like an over-eager virgin every time he was alone with her. He simply could not get enough. She bit his lower lip and pulled away, panting. She looked up into his eyes. Let's do it. Oh, yeah, he said. Are you ready for Luke the Wonder Llama? She raised one eyebrow and smirked. Really? What? Nothing. Wonder Llama? Do you have a rubber? Luke grimaced, his passion stymied. Yeah, it's in my bag by the fire. Deborah sat up, crawling towards the tent entrance. I'll go get it. That was not what Luke wanted to hear. He pulled her back down and kissed her lips. No, forget about it. Stay here with me. She kissed him back once, and then she was unzipping the tent and clambering outside. I have to pee anyway. Oh, you are killing me, he said, 
falling back on his sleeping bag and grinning at her. Hurry back, love. Deborah pulled up her panties in a hurry to get back to the tent and Luke's warm arms. She looked around, wondering where Alexis had gotten off to. It was a little odd for her to wander off without letting them know, but who was to say that she hadn't told them already while she and Luke were in the thick of it? They had been making quite a bit of noise, and the fun hadn't even really began yet. Oh well, she thought, as she walked back towards the fire. She's a big girl. She'll have to take care of herself for a while because my man is going to be taking care of me. She passed within a foot of Alexis's cooling body and didn't notice. I found it, Deborah said as she entered the tent waving the condom in her small hands. Yay, Luke said half-heartedly. He took it from her, twisting it in his hands. I hate these things. Oh, poor baby, she said, taking the condom from him and tossing it aside before climbing on top of him. He thrilled at the taste of her tongue, at the touch of her hand as she took him into her. She was velvet heat. She was a lightning storm setting him alight. She quickened her pace, sending him higher and higher, rising with him towards an explosion. They worked for it together, exquisitely attuned to each other's needs. This was what life was all about. What could be better? He reached out his hands to pull her hips. Close wasn't close enough. He shivered the words, I love you, trembling on his lips. He opened his mouth to shout and then screamed as a large metal fence post exploded from Deborah's stomach. She glanced down at it, unbelieving. Then the rod was jerked up with tremendous force. It passed through viscera and bone, exiting her body through her left shoulder. A frozen second passed, and then Deborah fell in two from the waist up, covering Luke in the tent in steaming entrails and hot gore. Luke tried to push free, and found that he was stuck, his member still trapped inside her spasming corpse. He shrieked, his mind shattering into a million pieces. He heard a ripping sound and looked past Deborah and saw two bloody hands widening the rip in the tent's wall. A wild man slumped inside to crouch over Luke, and Luke choked at the scent of decay emanating from him. He stepped forward and raised one foot over Luke's head. No! 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 The foot came down with all the force of a hydraulic press, popping Luke's head like a ripe grape. Bone fragments, blood, and pulped brains squirted out of the shattered cranium to add to the refuse now covering every inch of the ruined tent's interior. Jason stepped back out through the tear and strode off, his left leg dragging a little with each step. This man, this haunt body he occupied, was beginning to tire. He would need new materials soon if he was going to reach his final goal. Lucky for him, the world was full of replacements. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 4 and 5 of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, a fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. I want to say thank you to Jeremy. He's doing an excellent job. And uh, Rashad, I hope you enjoyed uh, your little chapter here in this fan novelization. Rashad won the drawing where everybody got to enter if they wanted to have a chance at uh, being one of Jason's victims in this book. Uh, Rashad was a patron at the right tier or higher, and he won the drawing. Uh, so yeah, I hope you had fun with that, Rashad. And Jeremy, I hope you had fun writing it. Uh, I really in, am enjoying what you're doing with the book, getting into Stephen's head a little bit in these chapters. Uh, you know, I always wondered if he was, you know, having second thoughts about following through with meeting up with Diana and, uh, you know, heading out and going skinny dipping with the young college co-ed. Uh, so thanks for filling in some of the blanks there. 
Uh, these were some fun chapters. I'm sorry it took me a while to get them released. Uh, Jeremy did finish these a few days ago, and the ebook version, the updated ebook version, will always be available on Patreon before the narration comes out. Uh, as he he is writing this, so it's a work in progress. Uh, great chapters, great kills. I uh, can't wait to see how much we dive into exactly what's going on with Jason, what's going on in his mind as he's having to find new bodies, why he's shaving a dude before, you know, taking over his body, and then the deputy that talks while he's possessed by Jason. I'm curious to see uh, what you do with that, Jeremy. And uh, I know some people are wondering about uh, Creighton Duke's backstory, his girlfriend being one of Jason's victims and things like that. And uh, all these people that live in Crystal Lake, maybe they've got memories of seeing Jason, uh, you know, glimpsing him walking into the woods or something at some point in their, uh, in their past. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. This might be one of the strangest uh, Jason films ever made, but it's one of the most original. And honestly, for me, it's one of the most fun. Jason Goes to Hell and Jason X are two of my favorite Jason movies of all time. Uh, they might not be, you know, the popular favorites, but they've always been a lot of fun for me, and I felt like they added more to the to the franchise and didn't really take anything away. So, great, great chapters. Looking forward to the next interlude uh, from the Journal of One Elias Voorhees. That's another interesting thing Jeremy's adding to this story and uh, something I'm definitely excited about. So please let me know what you all thought of these chapters. Let Jeremy know uh, what you think of his work so far. I'll be back very soon with more. I will also be working on my uh, Freddy in Space book that I'm writing called Celestial Slumber. i uh, got a really great outline done for it. All the characters are fleshed out. Key events that are going to take place, the kind of nightmares the people are going to have. And if you thought Jason got an upgrade, just wait until Freddy does. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. And uh, i got to recommend the Jason X sequels, especially Jason X 3 and Jason X 5. Uh, those books, at least, the, at least the ending of Jason X 5, the book, will come into play uh, towards the end of my story uh, with Freddy. So um, that, that's one reference point that you might need. Uh, so you know exactly what's going on towards the end of uh, Celestial Slumber. But it's also not necessary. I will uh, do a little explaining in the story uh, to help make that make sense. All right, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80s slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. We'll see you next time.